Hello, welcome to another Geotech Hour. This one is a special one in which we are celebrating the launch of the Geotech Center's report on smart partnerships involving AI and China. We are really excited to have an august panel here today to talk about the work that was done over the last year as we worked to understand what China is doing with AI, not just in China, but around the world, in Europe, in India, in Africa, and other places globally. This work was part of the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center where I'm the inaugural director, I'm Dr. David Bray, and what we've been doing with the Geotech Center is recognizing that data and tech are changing the world. They're changing geopolitics, and similarly, geopolitics and how the world operates changes how data and tech is implemented and the values that are embodied in societies. This work that we did with Smart Partnership Series would not have been possible without support from our partners at the Rockefeller Foundation. And so it's why it's my great honor to welcome to the stage Dr. Kevin O'Neill from the Rockefeller Foundation to provide some initial remarks as to the work that was going on with the Smart Partnership Series and why it's important to understand what China is doing with regards to AI globally. Kevin, why and why, why and how have it been so important to understand these initiatives? Sure. Thank you, David, and thank you to the Geotech Center and the Atlantic Council for having me today. Um, and I want to congratulate Matt and Julian and the other panelists and your participants in a terrific set of workshops on uh, a really insightful series of meetings and also a, a terrific capstone report and a set of writings that I hope people will seek out. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation has been supporting research into artificial intelligence going back to 1956 uh, when we supported the Dartmouth Summer Research Program on artificial intelligence, which as far as we know is the first usage of the term. Um, today we are unabashed promoters of the use of machine learning being applied to social problems, to environmental problems, to the world's biggest problems. Um, do, making that happen requires working beyond borders. And we know that technology doesn't know any borders, human ingenuity doesn't know any borders, and data doesn't know any borders. So we have to cooperate and we have to collaborate. At the same time, we recognize that we can only drive fast if we have good steering and we have good brakes. Uh, so we need the guidelines, we need the understanding, um, and we need, in some cases, the rules um, needed to make sure that we use data and analytics, not just uh, well, uh, but responsibly. Um, so there are three things that I think are really crucial about the Atlantic Council's work and about this uh, report and this series of dialogues. One, it was dialogue at a time when dialogue was difficult. Uh, in particular, when dialogue between the US and China, um, but to, ex uh, to a certain extent, other dialogues were, were challenging. Um, scientists, researchers, uh, practitioners of, um, of artificial intelligence and machine learning were still having dialogues, but political dialogues were difficult. And I salute the council for really promoting those dialogues uh, at a tough time. Uh, secondly, it was truly multipolar. Uh, recognizing uh, that insight is as likely to be found in Kigali as it is in Brussels when we think about artificial intelligence and uh, the ways that can meet the future. Uh, and the third thing is, is ahead of the curve. Um, we're at a time when um, I think no country or bloc has a fixed approach to artificial intelligence um, or to data governance. Um, so that there's an opportunity to craft things through international dialogue while, while we still have time. Um, Rockefeller has hosted its own series of events focused on artificial intelligence, drawing in practitioners, researchers, and legal scholars. Um, I want to highlight two ideas that have emerged from this, those workshops that have relevance to uh, this report and to this series. Um, one is we heard a call for the models and especially the training data um, used to train models um, to be available for public use and to be generated for application to global problems, not just for commercial use and for uh, commercial applications. 
Um, and it's terrific to see this call for digital public goods and digital public goods for, art, for AI reflected in the Chinese eight priorities, uh, the UN um, Commission on Digital Cooperation, uh, the upcoming World Bank World Development Report and other declarations of, inten of intent. Um, the other thing that we heard loud and clear from participants is that um, rules and principles may not be enough. Um, AI moves quick, um, data moves quick, and we need institutions that can really understand the technology and keep up with it and promote the, not just the regulations, but the practices that can keep up with the rapid pace of change in the field. Something like a National Highway Safety Transportation Administration for uh, data and AI. Um, we don't have those institutions domestically yet. And when we do, I think these international dialogues will get a lot more, a lot easier. And that um, it would be great to see the international conversations uh, feeding back to the formation of those institutions. Thank you all for being here today. I'm extremely excited to learn from the conversation. Thank you, Kevin. And I really appreciated your remarks, especially about talking about how we need to recognize the importance of difficult conversations, diverse conversations, timely conversations, and then translating that into action. Uh, you're absolutely right that we don't currently have some of the domestic institutions that this report cites as being necessary. And as you said, once we have those institutions then the international dimensions of these dialogues will take on a whole new level of, uh, of both excitement and, and also possibility for human uplift globally. I also want to give a shout out that you had an MC Escher diagram or picture in the background. Uh, really appreciate that because that also points to the purpose of perspectives. We also recognize that with the reports cover uh, and that we are big fans of MC Escher as well, Kevin. So thank you for everything that you've done in terms of as a partner and also to the entire Rockefeller Foundation for making this work possible. Thank We'd you. like to now welcome to the stage Ed Luce uh, from FT, who is going to moderate an uh, impressive discussion with uh, Dr. Matt Burroughs, as well as Julian Mueller-Keller, who were instrumental in leading this effort. Over to you, Ed, and thank you again for all that you're doing to help raise awareness of these global issues of AI, China, and global dialogue. Oh, thank you, um, David. Um, uh, this is a this is a great and um, sanity boosting um, relief from today's impeachment. Another week, another impeachment. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you also um, to Matt and Julian. Um, I had the great um, uh, pleasure of attending your first Geotech conference on this subject in Paris in the fall of 2019, which seems like a lot longer ago um, than it actually was, just 18, less than 18 months ago, in fact. Um, and I know that you've had conferences since then in, in Brussels, in Berlin, you've been to Beijing, um, virtual conferences with India and with Africa. This is a truly global and I think unique um, initiative on a massively important subject for across sort of any range of issues, not just geopolitical, um, but also as Kevin, I, I think very well illustrated there, um, humanitarian. Um, in terms of the potential for upliftment of people. And so um, I, I'm ex deeply interested in this subject and very appreciative of, of your report. I think um, a good place to start, uh, perhaps with Matt, is just if you could summarize the key sort of findings of, of this report, that would be very helpful. Well, thanks, Ed, and um, <laughs> thanks also for, uh, you did a wonderful article in the Financial Times on the first uh, meeting. I think there are a couple of themes here. One is, and Kevin has alluded to this, is we undertook this uh, as the US-China competition and particularly competition over technology was, was really taking off. So a lot of the conversations that we held talked about you know, people worried about will that interfere really with with global cooperation on this technology and degree to which that, you know, the the benefits that everybody sees are going to be uh, diminished because, you know, the example of, you know, Chinese researchers can't come to the U.S. Uh, and study or do research on certain themes and equally 
Uh, there's going to be reciprocal actions by the Chinese to, to block cooperation as well. And we see, uh, you know, in terms of globalization, a slowdown. So the, the areas that, you know, you could see cooperation, particularly uh, international cooperation, um, become a little bit uh, less. Uh, and, and that was, I think, a, a, a worry that we heard all over. The second one was that, you know, that this technology, like other technologies, uh, can do a lot of good, but there's also the worry about it will keep on increasing the potential for inequality. Now, obviously, there's the jobs issue, um, the automation. Uh, so that that was, you know, how is this one going to be different? This technology, the development of it, you know, going to exacerbate those tendencies we already see, or in some way, can this technology really be turned around for the benefit, you know, the larger benefit, and particularly in the meetings we had in Africa and India, we talked about how do you get this much more focused on the global challenges of food security, um, water, better infrastructure, um, those areas that uh, that are really so needed and make sure that this technology does not uh, bypass um, the developing world. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of other themes and hopefully we'll get into this in the second part when we talk with the participants from the from the different uh, regions and different uh, roundtables that we held. But I, I would cite those three big issues, worry on international cooperation, secondly, the inequality issue, and, and third, uh, the degree to which this can, can really be a force for good on global challenges. Uh, Julian, would you like to sort of bolster any of those points as the co-author? Absolutely, I'm yeah, happy to. I mean, kind of following up on Matt's initial point uh, of um, great power competition, um, I think one of the one of the themes that we particularly heard from Chinese participants that we spoke to both at the roundtables in Europe as well as the ones we had in Beijing and Shanghai was that there are very very different perceptions um, on uh, modern technologies and how it is used in this frame of great power competition. One narrative that um, we often heard was that, you know, China might have been able to play at the high table, but they were always reminded who owns the casino. Um, and for them, you know, China in today's world does not just um, deserves to be a rule taker, but also a rule maker. While on the US side, and that uh, played out uh, significantly in uh, the Paris meeting that you had uh, participated in, um, it, it is now defined as a national security threat, right? When we talk about uh, modern technologies, we not talk about, as Matt uh, alluded to, um, you know, a force for good or um, ways to mitigate inequality, inequality on a global stage, but we um, talk about it from an angle of a great power competition and a national security threat. And with those two different perceptions, it is incredibly hard to rebuild trust that is necessary for having conversations about AI governance that potentially uh, are, you know, enable uh, government talks between the United States uh, and China, um, between other parts of the world. Uh, one particular uh, interesting focus of that um, um, was when we when we were in Europe, and there was really an, a fear, and I'm sure we'll hear about that later in the panel, that Europe is being put in a position where it has to choose sides with economic decoupling, um, as well as, um, you know, the entire discussion about 5G. Um, and Europe is somewhat really stuck in the middle. I mean, we just, uh, I myself am from Germany. Every, almost every second German car is, is sold in China. So there is a huge uh, dependency on the Chinese market. And um, with its third way that I'm sure we'll hear about, uh, hear about in the panel, they really try to be positioning themselves in the middle and somehow try to mitigate um, those intensive, intensifying uh, rivalry between the United States uh, and China. And 
I'll, I'll end with the, the last point. What was very striking for me was that when we had those roundtable discussions that featured academics, that featured politicians, that featured diplomats, it was mostly the politicians who saw it from a competition angle, and it was academics and scientists um, who say, who kind of try to embrace uh, the, the collaboration angle and say, you know, almost all technology development has always been a global endeavor. And in order to channel the good consequences and mitigate the negative ones, there really needs to be um, international collaboration on the issue because it's similar to climate change. Technology doesn't end at borders um, and it doesn't start within the nation state, but it really has global consequences, which is why we did that series on smart partnerships amid great power competition. Um, so um, looking at the Atlantic piece of this, the US and, and Europe, and choosing a fairly crude but globally very well known example, Matt, from the last week, um, Trump being taken off Twitter, um, along with um, 70,000 QAnon Twitter accounts. Um, a, a massive demonstration of the power of big tech, an extraordinary demonstration, Facebook too. Um, immediately criticized by Angela Merkel of Germany um, as being the wrong way of going about it, that the, these things should be publicly, read, speech should be public, publicly regulated and not uh, within the purview of vast private platforms. Is this an example of where, as I say, at a fairly crude level of technology by today's standards, um, the United States can import best practice from elsewhere? Yeah, I think there's a huge question here of, you know, do the private, what are private sector companies have the ability since, you know, we communicate mostly by Twitter these days or Facebook or whatever, do they have the right um, to, without any sort of, of uh, public discussion or, you know, uh, decision making through um, the state really about what is in the national interest uh, without any of that being inputted into those those decisions and I think you know the, the Europeans obviously I mean believing that that worried about the power of these companies and we have to say here and I think we'll talk more about this is Europe feels particularly weak in this regard because it relies on US tech companies. So, so there's a, you know, the French have decided to go ahead to tax US tech giants simply because they see them as, as not paying their fair share. So there's a really a distrust anyway on the commercial. So it's probably, you know, this is a clash of kind of two, two different cultural viewpoints, but I tend to agree with the, Europeans that I think we do have to have some some rules of the road so that this doesn't become arbitrary um, by companies. Um, and, you know, we all, both sides of the Atlantic hold dear, really the, the, the belief in free speech. So, and that principle has to be protected. So I want to get on in a minute to uh, you know, the, the other parts of the world, still the majority of the world that are not China, the US uh, um, or, or Europe. But let me just ask um, either of you, whoever, whoever wants to answer. Uh, Julian, you mentioned that in the Paris meeting, the exchanges between the Americans and the Chinese were not particularly friendly. Um, I mean, I would say they were distinctly unfriendly. It was a very striking sort of series of exchanges for me to observe. Um, what are the chances, um, in your view, that with a with an incoming a new administration in the United States, that the um, the zero plus as opposed to the zero sum potential of artificial intelligence and technology can be better? That that conversation can change for the better. Well, I would hope it it does change for the better. Uh, indeed, I think there are two facets to that very question. First of all, um, I think there is a general frustration, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and, and other parts of the world that with an economic integration of China, um, you know, it has not been progressing towards a more liberal society. As a matter of fact, with Xi Jinping, we actually see a tighter control 
um, of of the very state. And and often those modern technologies are used to surveillance for surveillance purposes. On the other hand, I think that the, the discussion about China is also often um, kind of coinciding with uh, a, a more general trend in Western societies, um, mainly uh, kind of the, the, de the deterioration of what it means to be middle class. Uh, we saw that in the Trump uh, campaign, um, you know, China uh, used to be a scapegoat uh, for a lot of uh, larger issues, whether that's automation, whether that's uh, production lines moving away to different countries because of high costs. And to kind of um, differentiate those debates, I think, will be necessary in order to have um, conversations about a particular issue and not just conflate it all together. What is very uh, concerning uh, to me, and I think Matt shares the assessment, is that if you look at public opinion uh, about China in the United States, it really has uh, significantly worsened over the last year, uh, particularly also because of um, the pandemic and uh, what the Trump uh, administration officials often, often label as the Chinese virus. But it also, uh, you know, is a direct result of, of um, American officials um, and their harsh rhetoric towards China. So um, making this into a, a plus um, sum game where globalization is, is seen as a win-win and not as a lose-lose um, that, you know, uh, only has one side suffering more um, will we'll require a lot of efforts, uh, both in terms of trust building, as well as um, having competition in the areas that are necessary, but having cooperation um, in, in the areas that can't be tackled alone uh, by one government. So I hope that um, the Biden administration tries for, for a new approach. Um, I mean, the, the people that he chose uh, to lead his China policy uh, are not particularly known to being super China friendly, but uh, maybe we can move towards an environment that uh, Matt and I out also outlined in the, the future scenarios where there is um, cooperation on the essential questions like climate change and technology. Well, one of the things um, in Kevin's opening remarks that pricked up my ears was the fact that Rockefeller had uh, collaborated with Dartmouth in the, in the late 1950s. Um, and coined the term um, as best he could um, recall artificial intelligence, uh, late 1950s, the peak of um, Isaac Asimov's um, uh, stint as, a, as a, a futurist writer. Of course, one of Asimov's themes was the impact of automation on um, jobs. And I think we're all very aware by now that manufacturing jobs are shrinking in China, not just in the West. They're, that they're shrinking globally, um, partly because of technology. Um, so Matt, could you talk us through a little bit more what this means for Africa, India, other parts of the world that are looking to create middle classes, but might well find that the kinds of jobs um, that defined our middle classes are no longer in existence? Yeah, I, I think they have, as we heard, and we may get into this in the in the next section, that you know they they have a double problem in a sense. I mean, one is that unlike China, and China used the fact that Europe and the U.S. were outsourcing a lot of their jobs to them, and that they low labor costs in in China was you know, the, the basis on which a lot of their development was, was built. So, you know, Africa, other countries don't have that ability because now, as you were saying, we have the technology really to, to do the job that, that uh, people could, uh, had to do it at one time. The other thing is that they, they still have you know, and we heard this in India, uh, particularly, they still have a low labor cost economy. So for their own development, you know, for their entrepreneurs who are trying to get started, they don't benefit from the same market push that you see here because labor costs are very high. Um, so in a sense, I mean, it's it's this this really the double whammy. I think, you know, in terms of the developed world, I think we've gotten to a point, uh, and we may see more of this after the pandemic, that 
that there is a real political backlash now. Um, and, you know, the, if there's some surveys out showing that the business world is seeing the pandemic as an opportunity in which, you know, they, you have lots of people that they, they had to furlough or, or um, uh, uh, fire, um, they'll use the post pandemic period to reorganize their business, bring in a lot more technology. So there won't be the jobs for these people who are, who are unemployed. Um, and I think you're, you know, as we saw with 2008, we may be laying the, the, the really the basis, the foundation here for an, another backlash against the establishment, but backlash against um, technology as well on the very popular level. I think those are very legitimate um, um, concerns. Now you mentioned that we need to build institutions um, that can keep up with this technology, regulate it, conduct conversations cross-border about it. Um, uh, and um, produce a kind of positive sum world that we're all looking for. Julian, describe to me those institutions. One of the proposals that we heard um, at the French Roundtable in, in Paris was to kind of build it on a United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, similar where experts gather and share best practices, for instances, uh, for instance, um, and that then can be taken up um, and develop into AI principles. Um, we already see those kind of endeavors. I mean, um, I, many question of what they're worth on paper, but even China has, um, you know, published AI guiding principles um, that, uh, you know, could, could serve as a baseline for those conversations. So one of those elements that I just mentioned was really the idea to share best practices as much as warning about failures. Um, another way would be to have those continuation of conversations that we developed as well as academic exchanges. Um, most of the scientists that we spoke to even in China um, already or always highlighted the importance of open source of an open source community where it's mostly research collaborations uh, across borders um, to really kind of uh, emphasize the technology for good angle and the international angle of all of this um, and then trust building measures quite frankly um, where the, the the different narrative um, narratives that that I started um, my my um, talk um, earlier is that you know, they're not just seen from a security or national security angle, but to really try to emphasize um, each other's perspective. Um, you know, like one of the things that Matt just mentioned was the fact that, you know, the middle classes are also declining in China due to automation. Um, we heard from Chinese officials that they're creating millions of jobs, some jobs are somewhat artificially because of keeping the social peace. So, you know, the um, the request from Western uh, countries to organize firms according to capitalist standards would uh, require Chinese um, business people to basically fire, uh, you know, 30 or 40 percent of their staff because they're not profitable in that sense. So they're never going to do this because they want to uh, keep the social peace in that regard. So having forums of exchange that emphasize the cultural differences uh, and, and uh, enable a way for not just governments, but societies to build trust um, because, uh, you know, um, those modern technologies, the collection of data very much require uh, that people have trust in those um, technologies. This is an, an, an issue that we heard uh, very quite frequently at, at the Africa Roundtable that a lot of people don't necessarily require, like trust um, those technologies because often their data sets have not been integrated in machine learning. Um, you know, we've, we've heard this about uh, um, facial recognition not really working very well for um, darker skins and so on and so forth. So to, to have this trust angle, I think, is really key. Uh, and um, as I said, could be modeled uh, based on institutions that have uh, already served well in tackling other global problems such as climate change. Uh, well, that's a radical idea, social peace. Uh, I, I don't think it'll get past the shareholders meeting. Um, 
Matt, let me conclude um, with a, a question about industrial policy, a, a, a term that's sort of almost been taboo in uh, Washington um, and in London for, for the last 40 years or so, but that is coming back into fashion, partly because of this perceived competition, um, great power competition with China. Um, uh, and that, of course, to, would give people pause as to whether you know this is the right way of thinking about it. But on the other hand, um, heavy investment in research and development um, and sharing those gains with society is the kind of thing that you can only get at the state level. Um, you know, companies tend to have shorter term um, imperatives with their research and development budgets. Um, but when a federal government is doing it, it can produce quite remarkable um, advances and changes. China obviously already has an industrial policy made in China 2025 with the goal of dominating AI by 2030. And Europe is wending its way towards something approximating an industrial policy on this. Um, should we welcome the new age of industrial policy? You know, it, it depends. It depends on how it's implemented. I mean, if we look back, you know, to the Sputnik era, I mean, basically you had huge infusion the US in R&D. And we know from some economic studies that a lot of that, the DARPA, you know, that was what DARPA was founded then. A lot of things that DARPA did, the big beneficiaries were Google and Amazon and some of the big companies. So there's a question of, you know, should the, should we have a little bit more fairness there? So, given its public money, can, they, can the government actually get a return on some of that technology when it's used commercially? I think the, you know, I think we will be headed to that. And I think one thing is because for a long, for several years ago, federal R&D, which as you mentioned, is really the one that does the longer term um, research that had been heading downwards and, you know, we need to, to pull it back up. I mean, the pandemic is another uh, <laughs> reason that we need to really be pushing a lot more resources to the, to the uh, health community. But, you know, if we, if we want to just think about R and D without thinking about, you know, trying to get, the American educational system raise standards there that can actually help Americans, particularly those that, you know, have been shoved down in this globalization uh, field, feel that they're, they're, they, they don't have a chance at some of these big paying jobs that Google and others offer that their children are going to be on the short end of the stick because they won't have the skills to succeed in a much more automated society. You know, we, I think it has to be both. We have to, obviously, US needs to compete, but at the same time, we need to really pull um, up vast majority of Americans. I mean, educational standards sinking, we have to make sure that they can really succeed in a, in a technological, super technological age. Uh, well, that seems like a good note to hand back to you, Matt, um, to, to um, begin the, the panel. I'm sorry I can't stay with you for that, but um, uh, I'm sure it'll be riveting, a hugely important topic. And once again, many congratulations on, uh, on doing this work and bringing this report out. Well, thank you, Ed. I mean, uh, we hope next time that we can get you longer. And uh, also, as we do more of this, that uh, we can get you to future meetings. It would be my pleasure. So we have the, uh, really the, uh, the uh, chance of a lifetime here to, to really hear from a broad or for um, a large enough group um, 
of the participants, so four um, participants who are very vocal in the, in the roundtables that we held in Paris uh, or in Brussels, Berlin, um, India and Africa were virtual meetings. So uh, we actually pulled in uh, experts from a, for the Africa uh, virtual meetings from a broad array of countries in Africa. And also India, we tried to um, bring in a, a diverse um, group of participants from around India. So we have four, I would say, representatives of, of, of those uh, roundtables. Uh, what I intend to do here is engage individually, um, briefly for a few minutes to talk about how they see the uh, the particular challenges and also the benefits of the AI revolution uh, for their particular country or region. Um, and then uh, at the end of that, uh, we'll have a broader discussion uh, looking at this question, particularly of cooperation. So I'm going to begin with um, Luis Diego Cardoso. Uh, he is the Digital Technology Innovation Advisor to the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Um, he uh, participated, as I, as I indicated, in the, in the Brussels Roundtable. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how um, the European Union, and particularly officials in uh, Brussels, uh, really look on both the, the benefits and the challenges of this, of AI and, and the emerging te technologies. Over to you, Luis. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Atlantic Council and the Rockefeller Foundation for the initiative and warmly congratulate yourself, obviously, and Julian for the for the report that I, I read with uh, deeply interest. Indeed, as you were saying, I was part of the Brussels Roundtable, and uh, I can assure you and everyone that we had very interesting uh, discussions. There's a very nice summary report that is also on the Atlantic Council website that I can advise everyone to to look into it. But as you were speaking before about AI technologies, but also machine learning. I feel that before zooming in, it's always important to zoom out and look into the global scene, precisely to this uh, great power co competition, digital sovereignty that you are raising. First and foremost, we see that we are uh, living uh, after 13 consecutive years of decline in global uh, freedom. We see a change in international order with the protectionism being on the rise and new international organizations being settled, mainly in Asia, as we can uh, understand. And then third, we, we have this uh, paradigm feature of today's world disorder that is very much related to the great power competition we saw before the analysis of Russians interference in US and European elections, um, China's expanding its foreign policy assertiveness in full concerns in the Asia Pacific region. So the the volatility and uncertainty that we have today in the in the global world, it's not only linked to the digital technologies that we know it today and we discuss about the, um, the different type of uh, tech world, but it's also the, the case that uh, it was broader than the digital uh, area. So in fact, and as the report uh, says, and um, we in Europe, we have been advocating for this third way of de developing modern digital technologies. A different way that in comparison to the US more liberal approach, if you can say, is where companies are more center straight, and concerns for uh, privacy um, are less uh, raised at European level, or also different from the Chinese approach, as you were saying, that state sponsorship, state backing, and state funding are on the centre uh, stage. We in Europe, our third way of developing these new technologies and precisely artificial intelligence is very much uh, focal on regulations, on standards, and on concrete measures to defend the citizens' privacies, 
uh, ethical concerns, societal uh, concerns that we are uh, developing. Even today, we have been discussing of banning or not banning facial uh, recognition. I think that the GDPR, it was a good example in the past. Uh, honestly speaking, it was a little bit criticized by different uh, type of experts. Today is being adopted in California, in Japan, even in some countries of Latin America. But we also see over there in the US and in the in DC, even some uh, congressmen already starting to to discuss it. So the fact is that in the last uh, in the last times we have been turned Europe into normative uh, superpower. I think brand Europe as being synonymous with technology excellence, trusted quality, I think world-class safety standards. And what we need to bring now to this brand Europe is precisely the speed and agility to match these market uh, dynamics. And on artificial intelligence, speed and scale is more important uh, than, uh, than ever. And you see that in Europe, what we want to, to do is precisely to bring um, countries together to bring companies uh, together in common digital projects because we feel that only together as we are doing on batteries on high performance computing we are able to create the digital technologies of the of the future we also want to share uh, anonymous data between different uh, stakeholders in, in which is known the european uh, data spaces so that everyone can benefit uh, from the data that companies uh, have or universities or N, uh, NGOs. So what I'm saying is that we are currently facing in the digital world is not different the volatility that we had in the political areas uh, before, but we also need to make sure that we bring the adoption and diffusion of new technologies into the real world that, uh, that we have. But as the discussion is also about the great power competition, I feel that there are some questions that we ask ourselves and everyone needs to ask our uh, ourselves is that fair that online platforms decide whom can post online and ban users or it's more fair that governments develop strong ethical rules that tech companies uh, should follow is also fair that tech companies no, not pay the same level of uh, fair taxes as traditional offline uh, shops or do you also want to live in a society mainly um, impulse with automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, as George Orwell was describing in his book 1984, where governments are constantly surveilling us in our daily activities, and we almost need to create a ministry of, uh, of truth. So I also think that sometimes we need to go deeper into the questions and ask ourselves in which society we want to live and how do we want to develop these modern and new technologies uh, for the future. Thank you, Matthew, and then I'll be happy to to join the, the key and day and to deep dive in other questions that uh, we might have together. Well, Thank you. One follow up question, if you could maybe just answer it um, briefly, is, you know, as you mentioned, and we have talked a lot already in this session about the growing competition between China and the US and in the US, particularly, you know, Chinese technology represents a big uh, national security risk. Uh, and you're seeing increasingly that that's the prism by what, by which, you know, government and even a lot of the public is looking on, uh, on, on uh, Chinese technology like Huawei. And you've seen the US go to Europe and, and tr try to persuade well, I would say with some success, uh, countries not to, to buy on to Huawei technology. And I'm, and I'm sure there would be other cases like that. To what extent can Europe maintain a third way, which sounds kind of, kind of a little bit, you know, equidistant between Washington and Beijing, uh, when there is so much pressure and obviously the transatlantic uh relationship is a lot deeper than than europe's with with china how can you see europe being able to 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 really forge an independent um pathway i don't think that is a more um, 
independent pathway that we want to to develop between uh, uh, ourselves because i feel that when we speak about uh, this concept of digital sovereignty or uh, strategic autonomy as others they uh, they usually like to to say the idea is not to be independent and decouple from the the other global uh, economies by by itself I feel that when we speak about technological sovereignty is also that uh, we want to act internationally and we want to have the means to act internationally also on the digital uh, front. If I can sell, tell you that we, we might have an inter in the internal dimension that is very much on building the resilience of our economies, societies and also digital supply chains in order to be less dependent from uh, other economies, but also on the external dimension. I will say that this can also give us the power to act internationally and the discuss with international uh, partners that uh, sometimes when we are developing these technologies, we are not able to do it uh, in our days. So we, we feel that we want to decrease our current vulnerabilities. We also want to increase our critical capabilities to make sure that we are able to develop these technologies that also fit into Europe's uh, purpose. Um, so tech sovereignty is not a, an end by itself. I feel that it's not also building against anyone else, as uh, sometimes we hear. It's precisely to give Europe the means that we can act uh, internationally. And you're speaking about the United States and, uh, and China, obviously, that we are very much looking forward to the to the tech discussions that we might have with with the new president and you and uh, Biden's uh, team, um, but uh, obviously President van der Leyen already presented a, a very interesting strategy uh, that we put forward precisely to cooperate and even on on AI. Why don't we cooperate more and facilitate the free flow? Uh, data we trust as we propose or we have these uh, transatlantic dialogues precisely on the responsibility of online platforms and tech companies uh, but also china we, we see it and we always saw it as uh, there are areas of confrontation there are areas of competition there are areas of uh, cooperation china today um uh, strangely speaking it moves very fastly from a copy um, um, technology development to one of the areas developing the new emerging and fast emerging uh, technologies uh, comparing to to before. Um, the question is precisely in which society we want uh, to live and uh, which are the like-minded partners that we can rely on and which ones we can partner for our future societies. And then we also need to, to see how the world will uh, follow through, mainly through our Indian and African partners that we also have here on the, on the table. Well, thank you, um, Luis. I wanna now um, talk to Enola Mafi, um, and she was a, uh, excuse me, let me just get her bio up. So she was a lead on the 2030 Vision Technology and Sustainable Development Project at the World Economic Forum. And she was a participant in our uh, virtual Africa uh, roundtable. I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about the, the challenges, the special challenges that Africa faces in using the the uh, the promise anyways of ai for for development um, and also how the advanced economies can be and those you know that are farther along in using ai could be helpful to that that effort um thank you so much um and thank you to the atlantic council and uh and also to the Rockefeller Foundation, um, especially for this um, congratulations on this uh, very great report um, and the consultative process that, that got to this point. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I mean, this this is a, it's a, you know, Africa is 54 countries, 1.2 billion people and uh, about 2000 languages. Um, so I will kind of make my 
comments on um, in response to the question a little bit um, broad, but also give some ex uh, some country and, and, and uh, uh, scenario examples, um, which will probably kind of give some more elucidation to where we think where I think things are trending. Um, you, Matthew, you mentioned um, a couple of things around inequality around international cooperation, um, specifically regional cooperation with Africa's um, Africa's free uh, free trade agreement and the potential integration, the, the upcoming and impending in integration of, of Africa from a trade perspective, but also from a digital and other other kind of um, areas where it will closely kind of converge and harmonize efforts. Um, so when we think about these principles, and I think Julian had mentioned this with AI principles and thinking about the bedrock that's needed, um, I'm hopeful that there are there will be a more harmonizing um, broadly continental digital cooperation approach, um, which um, yields which could yield some real opportunities to think about literally economies of scale um, and thinking around markets and hubs and spokes in particular urban areas, um, particular cities across the continent. Um, but then, you know, there is this significant piece that is that is a um, that is um, uh, of concern, I would say, which is fundamentally we have about 28.2 percent of the people in Africa who do not have access to the internet. I mean, more broadly, globally, 3.6 billion um, do not have access. So when we think about kind of a prerequisite to the kind of assets that an AI system would even need to function, um, it does bring up these questions around connectivity and unequal access um, to data that we need, really need to consider, especially in a continent like Africa. There's obviously different regional, sub-regional um, uh, variations there, but all in all, we can safely assume that you know AI solutions can't really springboard themselves to form out of nothing um, or limited data or lack of digitalization of or digitization of data. Um, and they emerge from communities. We, we're kind of seeing that there are communities of researchers, of entrepreneurs, of those within the ecosystem um, who are really kind of keeping the ground, the groundwork and building that incrementally. Um, but there still needs to be quite a number of investments and key strategic investments that need to happen. And as I said, it, AI relies on, on large amounts of data. And some of the first kind of policy questions or concerns that I, I, I bring up is access and cost of processing that data, visualization, all of those pieces. Um, and as we know, um, African citizens kind of data will be managed um, in, in a distributed way. Um, we've seen that there has been a lot of conversation around data servers, a lot of conversation around protecting privacy and rights of those who are coming online. And that's added with another level of complexity of digital literacy. So um, while we still have, while the conversation that Lewis had mentioned about protection of privacy and rights and, and the work, obviously, that the focus of of, of Europe's model on you know, standards for citizens and, and privacy, and, and obviously with GDPR being a significant pillar of that. Um, I think we're going to see a, um, I don't know if it's a third way or a fourth way, but somewhere in the middle where you're going to see a significant hybrid, um, where, it's a com where we're seeing that there's a lot of movement on innovation in AI by startups, by entrepreneurs, who are either venture backed or, or, or the like. Um, but then there's a bit of a dual carriageway, a, 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 a parallel kind of um, catch up process that's happening with policy. Um, and I think to be honest, to be fair to the continent, um, this is happening across the world, um, but I think it has um, real implications when it, comes to, um, uh, when it comes to Africa, partly because of the, you know, the, the not as strong institutions in some areas, and also the need for digital literacy of the populace um, writ large. So I do see kind of some promising pieces. I, um, one is this cluster of research conferences and specialized kind of educational opportunities, um, inter intercontinental collaboration that we're seeing even now um, with the round table. Tech leaders are stepping up 
Africa tech leaders are stepping up and they're building core networks of experts as well. Um, so you're seeing a number of, hub, of hubs and innovation hubs um, on AI technology and its deployment. And I think in terms of something that would be in, uh, very important for intercontinental collaboration um, and international co cooperation is the fact that we're starting with these very big issues, SDGs, um, at least 10 out of the 17 SDG go global goals can actually be achieved through technology. We're seeing that also African um, leaders are thinking around their digital transformation, digital um, uh, uh, transformation uh, strategies as part of their master planning as a means of coming out of um, or responding to and recovering from COVID, um, thinking about how they're entering into or supporting a digital economy and AI is a significant pillar of that. Um, and we see kind of the cost reductions, we see the, uh, the efficiencies that are built in that have significant effects um, in many countries. So examples are in health, in financial services, in, um, in mobility, um, in, in literally every single area that you could think of, um, it could, uh, um, AI could actually be beneficial. And I think another uh, last piece in terms of um, where, we're, where I, I am hopeful, but also um, cautiously optimistic is that we know that Africa has the highest youth population in the world. Uh, about 60% of uh, the African population is under the 25 years. So when we're thinking around this um, large youth bulge that we're seeing that we could be projected for the continent to have the largest age cohort by 2070 and thinking around the deployment of, of AI, and I think others have mentioned this in terms of the long-term play of investment that is needed to be able to really generate the, the, the positive externalities of, of AI deployment um, and even cooperation around it is how do these developments in AI that I've mentioned earlier differentially impact this younger generation? Um, and I think in a couple of ways in terms of the demographic, uh, demographic dividend in thinking around how we're thinking of global future of work and where the, where the, um, where the labor will be coming from, um, but also in terms of automation and increasing kind of the skills premium um, that kind of exacerbates the income inequality piece. I think we're seeing some dynamics that could really shock um, our expected paradigms of what, of how the, this will play out. And I think um, Africa is a good test ground, but it needs to be very clearly defined from an African perspective. It needs to be um, defined in partnership with others who see this future the same way that, 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 that the continent leaders, entrepreneurs, business leaders see it. Um, and then it's also a, a, a concept around, it's, it, there, is, there are some lessons on AI that are happening all across hubs in, in Africa that actually have benefits and, um, and could actually be lessons learned for, for Western countries as well. So I will stop there and, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we can ponder on some of those com comments later. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, that was very comprehensive. Just wonder quickly if you could give um, an example or two maybe of country or on a sector where Africa appears to be really moving ahead uh, and there's a success story there. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the key things is that um, uh, the leapfrog approach, even though I don't like to say that word as much, uh, I think one of the, the, the countries that has, has kind of um, been an outlier, even though it is, is a small, smaller country, is Rwanda from a leadership perspective in tying into its digital transformation strategy thinking around this, it, I think it now has an AI center that is both a public-private initiative. Um, uh, World Economic Forum is also involved in that center as well. Um, and it's primarily focused in specific ways, whether it's health, um, it vaccine and, um, and uh, drug deployment. Um, then it's focused on some other areas around finance and, and, and others. And I think that kind of clarity of vision being clear about what, how does the, how does a technology, in this case AI, 
um, translate to the, um, the master planning and development of the country and it being in the service of that. I think that, I, that concept actually makes a lot of sense um, and it's very clear. And then you're building in the skill sets, they're building in the skill sets for the, the uh, labor force that will be able to utilize those, um, those, um, the, that, that technology. So it's building an entire ecosystem around that. So I do believe that that kind of ecosystem approach tied into development works. Um, there's also examples, especially in agriculture that we've seen um, uh, come up, especially in Southern Africa. Um, uh, BKB, it's a hundred year old S, um, uh, South African uh, agricultural company. And that has been focused on kind of a hundred thousand clients and getting them into the digital age. So this is a more of a strategy of looking at how AI can be used both as a, a, a company and a business trans, um, digital transformation process, but also provide value, um, create value for clients um, in a, and bring them into the digital age. So that, that actually is very interesting for me because we're seeing that, you know, you're seeing radical changes in industries that have been quote unquote traditional, like the wool industry in South Africa, and now is a model for it kind of extending to meat supply chain. Um, you know, and uh, just the last one that I'll share and also in Southern Africa is around uh, the kind of radio frequency identification tags for animals. And that's been deployed in many countries uh, across Southern Africa. It uses a combination of blockchain and te um, technology and AI to enable kind of the livestock farmers to generate um, apply, analyze, and share useful data um, on the animal's progress. So this also provides information to the, to the primary producers, to farmers. It creates greater information or reduces a information asymmetry within the, within the value chain. And then it's also allowed to provide data for the entire ecosystem. So I think those are really exciting things that we've seen across these kind of traditional industries or traditional sectors where we're seeing kind of a digital transformation approach. Um, and I think that kind of step laddering up is, is, a, is a strategy that I think is, is, has proved um, to be a win for many countries or, or, or markets and, in, and sectors. Well, thanks so much. That is, is, you know, I try to always, I mean, there's bad enough news <laughs> even in this report, but I mean, this is, uh, you know, what struck me in the in the Africa discussions is is really the optimism, despite all the challenges. So thank yeah. you very much. Uh, we're going to turn now to uh, Ambassador Latha Reddy, who um, let me get my bio sheet again is um, the co-chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Um, and was a participant in um, one of our India roundtables. Uh, again, that was a virtual roundtable. I wanted to, to get back, maybe and this is <laughs> to one of these challenges um, of the increasing Sino-US um, competition. And obviously we, we talked a lot about um, India's growing tensions too with, with China. And despite the fact that China, Chinese companies have played a huge part in, in, in the tech scene in, in India, I wondered if we could get your kind of thoughts on where India is going. Does it want to choose uh, or you know, doesn't it want to choose between the two, US and China? Um, and what do you see as in the near future for India? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Yes, um, India's relationship with China is a complicated one. It always has been. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the border issues with China, the territorial issues with China have exacerbated, uh, particularly over the last year. We've actually had clashes between our troops though it was one of the most peaceful borders in the world with not a shot being fired for over uh, 40 years in spite of the disputes in the past. Um, and unfortunately, we've, that record has been sullied somewhat 
by the really violent clashes and loss of life on both sides. Uh, obviously, it is now seen as a very adversarial relationship, and that's had an effect. Chinese investment uh, has been uh, blocked in certain cases. Um, Chinese applications have been uh, have been um, banned. The TikTok, uh, WeChat, and so on. And um, you know, the I think this till the geopolitical tensions with China are resolved. I think there is no question of India really choosing a major partnership with China on artificial intelligence or uh, in any other area. We continue, of course, to talk in international fora and uh, we recognize as the two largest countries in Asia that we have a particular, uh, a particular responsibility to the, uh, to the region. And uh, we are both members of BRICS. Uh, and um, uh, India also attends the SOC meetings. So I would not say the relationship is irretrievably damaged. India, China is still a major trading partner for, um, for India. Uh, but having said that, I, as I said, I think on artificial intelligence, I don't really see a major relationship developing with, uh, with China. With the US also, you know, I don't think it's very straightforward in certain sense to have a completely integrated relationship, say, along the lines that uh, Europe has had and countries like Japan, South Korea, Singapore have had, uh, simply because we are not in any kind of a military alliance with the US. But certainly the relationship is good in spite of the current uh, transition period in the US and all the accompanying tumult. Uh, we are confident that the bipartisan uh, you know, consensus on the importance of a strategic relationship with India will continue. So I would say at this point, I'm much more optimistic about cooperation in the area of artificial intelligence, digital technology in general, with the US than with China. Having said that, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about India and how we mm -hmm. see artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I think on artificial intelligence, exactly as we did on cyber technology, where India started the program known as Digital India, where the intention was to get as many people connected as possible. Uh, and uh, I think AI will also be used for development and empowerment as well as economic growth. Um, you know, in that sense, in the report, you I noticed the authors, and I must congratulate them on this excellent report, have discussed the concept of technology for good. And they've specifically talked about healthcare, food security, agriculture, education, and infrastructure. And uh, during the pandemic, for example, certainly we realized the importance of uh, digital technology and artificial intelligence tools in the areas of healthcare, education, with all the learning going online, and e-commerce to a certain extent. Right now in India, uh, which is doing remarkably well in terms of, if you look at the per capita figures of India, they are very, very low in terms of the number of people infected or the number of case fatalities. And tracking, testing, and even the vaccination infrastructure that we are now setting up is all using cyber technology and artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that this, this is really going to be a turning point in how we see artificial intelligence as being able to benefit the population. Our planning commission, or Niti Aayog, as it's now called, I had brought out a working paper on the national strategy for artificial intelligence. And as far as I know, that is the last um, definitive statement of the government on an AI policy. And there were five focus areas, again, healthcare, agriculture, education, smart city infrastructure, and transport and mobility. And what they saw as barriers for India developing a very coherent artificial intelligence strategy were the lack of research expertise, the absence of an enabling uh, data ecosystem, 
uh, high resource costs for AI research and low awareness for adoption of uh, artificial intelligence and a lack of regulatory uh, system around uh, privacy and security and the absence of a collaborative approach even within India, within the different organizations and stakeholders. Uh, they proposed a two-tiered framework to overcome some of these challenges. One was an academic framework mainly funded by the government, which would set up centers of research in artificial intelligence, or CORDs as they're called, and international centers for transformational artificial intelligence. That's where I see the scope for international cooperation coming in. And these would be industry-led. Uh, NASCOM, our national uh, body for electronics and uh, for digital uh, industries, has forecast that um, artificial intelligence can generate as much as $500 billion in a GDP growth by 2025 if artificial intelligence is properly fostered. Uh, there are now advanced postgraduate studies available in artificial intelligence in the Indian Institutes of Technology, the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, which is where I'm based. And Bangalore itself has emerging as a huge research hub for artificial intelligence. And currently, even currently, without the growth that is envisaged, uh, India's, uh, as of August 2020, India's artificial intelligence market was based at $6.4 billion. And this was, of course, divided between multinational IT firms, domestic IT and ITES firms, uh, capped, what we call captive firms, which uh, with global in-house operations in India, form, uh, firms are required uh, to uh, undertake certain research activities in India. And domestic firms themselves in telecom, oil and gas, pharma, private banking, uh, automotive industry and cross-sector. And you have engineering firms, you have the public sector firms and uh, government uh, research organizations. You have boutique artificial intelligence companies, you have consulting firms, and you have aggregator startups, which I believe is an enormous area which will grow even further. India is one of the biggest startup communities in the world. So the wide range basically shows the promise of the future, what we can do with artificial intelligence, and the confidence of the international system itself, because I referred to the multinational companies using Indian capabilities. So I would say, in my opinion, on artificial intelligence, India can emerge as a hub if it plans well, if the resources come in, and if there's true cooperation between government, industry, and academia. And I think, uh, you know, the, the future looks bright to me as far as artificial intelligence development in India is concerned. But as we all know, plans are easy to make. Implementation is the problem. And we still are struggling with a very large unconnected population who don't have even basic yeah. connectivity, leave alone access to artificial intelligence. But I do believe that uh, it's possible with, with good political leadership and proper investments, I think we can get there. One of the, um, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, that is also a very comprehensive uh, view and uh, really touches on a whole bunch of issues. One. One issue that we heard from several entrepreneurs, we had a second round table with the health industry. I'm not sure you were in that, participate in that round table, but there was um, several who, uh, you know, talked about the, the relative scarcity of, of data that they could use. And that, uh, you know, they saw that, and I think you mentioned this as one of the the, the goals in the government plan is, is really to um, bring together different authorities um, to, uh, to get the, the data really into the entrepreneur's hands. 
And, you know, they talked about having to use U.S. or European data, which really That's was not right. suited to Indian uh, conditions. And then also talked about, you know, in some cases that they were really working, had to turn and work for, for U.S. Um, uh, firms in Silicon Valley. Um, do you see this as, as, as being solved? Um, or first, I guess, do you see this as a, as a major barrier for the entrepreneurs? Uh, and do you see this being solved in, the, uh, in order for, for India really to take off? I, I think the real issue is uh, of uh, data privacy. You know, I think the question is, if we can work out a good system for data privacy where the participants in any uh, data collection used for health by healthcare providers agree mm -hmm. that their data can be provided. And that's where, you know, India's own Data Protection Act comes in. And I mean, once that's very clearly implemented, uh, the uh, I don't think Indian entrepreneurs will any longer face that problem. It's a very new system, so it will take a little while to seed through the system. But once that's done and it's defined what is sensitive personal information and what is not, and where you can give your consent and give it to the uh, companies, that will then happen, you know, and the entrepreneurs, I think, will have, but they will have to be, of course, certain checks and balances in terms of the security of the data. We've all seen what happened during the pandemic when uh, health systems were, in fact, attacked, you know, in certain countries. So I think we need to uh, uh, look at this and uh, see how best to get the data that the entrepreneurs need to them without violating the privacy of the individual. So that's, that's how I look at the problem, really. Okay, well, thank you again so much, um, both for your participation at the roundtable and also in this conference. I want to turn to our um, to Khan Saeem, uh, who was in the Berlin uh, Roundtable. He is Research Fellow for Technology and Foreign Policy. He was actually our partner, Julian, and uh, my partner in setting up the Roundtable um, at the German Council on Foreign Relations. He since then um, has been detailed as a strategic advisor for cyber diplomacy and, and the EU presidency in the German Foreign uh, Office. Um, I want to ask, uh, you know, this going back to um, conversation with uh, Luis, um, to talk a little bit more about how Germany. Uh, particularly, but also Europe um, is trying to balance um, between the US and, and China. Um, obviously in the round table, we talked a lot about strategic autonomy and that concept. I wondered if you could um, elaborate a little bit more on that, uh, particularly, and, and Julian mentioned this, uh, in the earlier remarks, I mean, Germany has a very strong trading relationship with, with China. Um, so obviously, um, maintaining that is, is, is one of the big national interests, um, at the same time as traditionally one of the strongest uh, US allies. So how, how to square the circle here? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Atlantic Council for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for the great insightful remarks uh, to my co-panelists. And also thank you very much to Matthew and Julian for the excellent report. Um, as you may know, um, until 13 days ago, Germany presided over the Council of the European Union from July 2020 until December 2020. And at the very beginning of the EU presidency, Germany made clear that the question of how a country or region can solve assert itself in a digital realm has become of prime importance, has to be addressed by the European Union and its member states, and there's a certain urgency to act. Therefore, and this is very interesting because Germany in a digital realm has decided not to use the concept of strategic autonomy, 
which is more coming from a military and security area, but using the concept of digital sovereignty. And in its program of its EU presidency, Germany said clearly, digital sovereignty should be the leitmotif, the guiding theme of European digital policy. And now we have to ask ourselves the question, what is digital sovereignty and what it is not? Let me very quickly answer, first of all, the second question, what is it not? And as Louis also already suggested, um, digital sovereignty does not mean digital autarky or digital isolation because digital autarky is a situation which is very difficult, if not impossible to achieve in the short or medium term, even for the so-called two technological superpowers, USA and China. And it is also, also not a very desirable state for Europe and Germany, because it would basically mean Europe and Germany would abandon globalization and the global innovation system. Of course, now in the next step, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is digital sovereignty? And even though digital sovereignty is not yet an official concept in the European, on European level, on the EU level, but also not in, the, in, Ger in Germany, I think we can say that certain aspects constitutes digital sovereignty. Aspects which were also touched upon by Germany's foreign minister Heiko Maas in a speech at the Bitkom conference last October. So we can say that the first component, the first component of digital sovereignty is the ability to possess key to technologies, the ability to produce innovations, and the ability to occupy strategically important positions in global value change in the technological realm. Second, the ability to strengthen the resilience of critical infrastructure networks and to protect our free and democratic societies against malicious cyber activities. And third, the ability to regulate emerging technologies and to set international standards and norms in that regard and that these international standards are in line with European values, such as human rights, human dignity, rule of law, data, pri data privacy, and so on. In the next step, of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, <laughs> what are Europe's capabilities according to those components? And what has Germany done during its presidency to perhaps maybe improve these capabilities? And of course, we cannot, due to the time frame, answer all those questions in an all-encompassing way. But if we glance at these components, we can say Europe and Germany has its strengths and weaknesses. And the European Union and Germany have acknowledged those related challenges and have taken some countermeasures. For instance, concerning the first component of um, the ownership of key technologies, we have to conclude that Europe is trailing behind the two front runners in critical areas. I mean, there are just few exceptions where Europe has um, strategic important um, companies in the global value chain of the semiconductor industry. Um, when it comes to the most promising AI startups, they are mostly so situated in the US and China. And for instance, the global cloud computing market is clearly dominated by American and to a lesser extent Chinese players. Interestingly, the technology area where G Europe and Germany, let me put it that way, have experienced the biggest pressure of this US-Chinese tech confrontation, the 5G technology, was is the technology area which can be seen as a strong point of Europe's technological prowess. And we had a very interesting debate about that also Germany, where Germany was in a kind of tricky situation how to deal this kind of Huawei issue, which they basically solved, I would say, in December with the new IT security law, which says that critical vendors will have a technical assessment, but also political one. Um, due to the time frame, I would maybe skip the second component. I will go straight to the third one, namely international standard setting and norm setting. And we can say internally, the European Union has met some headway. Um, for instance, with GDPR, with the NIST directive, with the ethical and legal framework proposed by the AI white paper. But um, in my latest article for the Atlantic Council, which I have written uh, in my capacity as a research fellow for the, tech, for the German Council on Foreign Relations with the title, The West China and AI Surveillance, I also claim that I think the European Union can adopt a more outward looking approach, especially when it comes to AI surveillance. And I also suggest that Europe should work together with the incoming Biden administration and like-minded states in order to contain the trend of um, digital authoritarianism. 
To be more precise, I say that concerning AI surveillance, uh, the West should adopt a threefold approach. First, European Union, the US, like-minded states in Africa, in Asia and South America, they have to first figure out for themselves how to find the right balance between the effective use of AI, or to be more precise, AI surveillance tools and preserving on the other hand, privacy and human rights and human dignity. Second, building on that, they have to present an alternative model in contrast to digital authoritarianism. And third, they need also to adopt a sophisticated approach towards China and authoritarian states deploying and employing these kind of technologies, which basically encompasses a twofold approach. Cooperate where possible, for instance, an area for tech for good, but collectively sanction if needed. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. I, I'm going to uh, let you off the hook on a second question because we're we're running out of time here. I wanted to actually, uh, there's a question here that's, that's come up from the audience, is to ask each of you to pick one of three scenarios that you see happening. So you have to, this is going to be the most likely scenario in your mind. And so the three choices are unequal world. This is where the developing world is, is really struggling. This is also where in the advanced economies you have great inequality in part caused by emerging technologies. Um, you have some Sino-US competition, but it, it does not dominate. The second choice is, um, bipolar world, which obviously says, you know, you have to make a choice between US and China. Um, it's one in which really globalization grounds, grinds to a halt. So it makes it very hard to cooperate on, on, on technologies. The third is multilateral resurgence. That's where you really, the global institutions come to the fore again um where there are forums for real cooperation and you get a real emphasis on this technology for good for dealing with global challenges so um con since i have you up um here what give me your what's the most likeliest over the next five years yeah of course, I hope for the multilateral resurgence, but I'm a little bit pessimistic when it comes to that. I think in the short term, I think the most likely scenario that we have is that we still have this kind of US um, Chinese tech confrontation, um, but I don't see a full fledged decoupling coming because um, as I already said, this is a situation which is also very difficult to achieve for the US and for China because they are dependent on each other. If you look at China's dependence uh, on US and Asian semiconductor companies, then you can imagine in the short term, we will don't have a decoupling. Um, I think in the, all those scenarios, what will be very important is, first of all, if the Biden administration can work together with the European Union, and what are, what are basically the ideas and the models for also the developing world in that context. Um, I think we have too much of focus on this US-Chinese tech confrontation and forget that also the developing world have their ideas of digital sovereignty and also the more developed countries have to find a model to, to support them, to help them in that. In that okay, I, I, we're under a little time pressure, Ambassador. Well, I'm an optimist, so I'm going to go for multilateral resurgence. Good. <laughs> Uh, one sentence on why you think that will happen? Well, you know, I think the pandemic has really shaken the world and made us realize that cooperation is more important than confrontation. That's the reason why. Great. Uh, Luis? Uh, thank you. I'll second ambassador and I'll also go to multilateral resurgence. And just a short explication, I feel that this also depends on the innovation cycles. I feel that before we had the first wave of innovation that was very much focused on products, the second innovation wave was focused on apps and platforms, and the future innovation wave, the one that we're developing, is precisely the intersection 
between uh, the physical and the digital world where Europe really uh, shies and we, we have very good industrial uh, data and obviously that we work together with the G7, G20, the OECD to work to a better world. Great. Uh, Enola? Yes, so I would like to tip my scale to uh, multilateral. Um, I am an optimist. Um, I think that, uh, and I wouldn't work at the World Economic Forum if I wasn't, um, but I, I think that the, the cooperation, the need out of the COVID um, and the pandemic has really kind of taught a lot of people significant lessons about sacrifice. However, I will say that it could be unequal if there is not the right deployment of the vaccine to um, the countries that probably need it um, are the most vulnerable when it comes to the, the, the pandemic. So I think that would be my caveat, which is uh, multilateral, but um, let's, let's wait and see for um, you know, the health, the public health issues that need to be curbed first for the global south. Well, thank, thank you all. It's been a wonderful um, conversation. Um, I think it's great to wrap up on an optimistic note. Too many of our conferences tend to be very, end up very pessimistically and people feel depressed. So this is really uh, great. And we hope to continue the conversation um, on these issues. I think we, we really got touched on the important one and I'm glad we got different perspectives. It wasn't just uh, Americans talking to Americans or even Americans talking to Europeans, but broadened it out. Thank you again.